previously on the sample sample. A local neighborhood blind man was ferociously attacked by mobs and mobs of increasingly angry ableists. However, using nothing but his pure wit and a whole lot of luck, he managed to scare them off with his army of fauna. However, in this episode, the ableists return as the blind gardener continues to fight for his survival. Okay, so if you didn't catch it from that whole cinematic intro, uh, this video is a part two. Spoiler alert, I've already beaten this game's story mode without looking. But if you want to see how I did it, there's a variety of places you'll be able to click to find that last video. But today, I'm challenging myself to go even further. By not just beating Plants for Zombies, but by 100% completing it. This means we'll be collecting the Golden Sunflower Trophy, which mainly involves just beating the 50 adventure levels, which we've already got done. However, we also have to beat all 18 puzzles, all 10 survival levels, and all 20 minigames. So, uh, wow, never mind, we actually have a ton left to do. So, without further ado, let us answer the question. Is it possible to complete Plants vs. Zombies while blindfolded? But before we get into anything too crazy, I just want to be real for a moment. Did you like that joke? I made a whole rant sona for this bit, so you better freaking enjoy it. Okay, but like, actually for real, uh, I just want to take this moment to be a bit transparent. That was the last one, I promise. Major news time. Uh, I'm full time now. Now this means a couple things. Uh, one, videos will come out a little bit faster. This is a promise. Thing number two, videos will be a little bit better. This is not as much of a promise. But honestly, uh, even though doing YouTube full time is this really cool and very exciting thing, uh, it's honestly, uh, you know, just a, a little bit actually very extremely scary. So I hope you guys can find it in your hearts to forgive me when I say that this video is sponsored by GamerSub. All right, I'm just kidding. I mean, I'm not kidding, that, that is the sponsorship and you probably should go in the link in the description. But no, what I actually wanted to come here and say is that I have a Patreon now. Whoa! Now, if you don't know what a Patreon is, then you can carry on, don't worry about it. But if you do know what a Patreon is and you're willing and able to support me, then I'd really appreciate it if you took a look. There are a couple benefits, but the main one, and this is something that I'm actually kind of excited about, is exclusive behind the scenes-esque content in the form of what I'm calling creator cuts. I've made the creator cut on this video free, so if you want to check it out after this video just to see what it's all about, then go for it. But I'm also making creator cuts for every single one of my older videos, and I'm going to be making a creator cut for all of my future ones. So if you think you would be interested in seeing the production cycle behind this channel or just hearing my own thoughts about my own videos then you can go ahead and click the link your support is what allows me to continue making these videos for hopefully a really long time i honestly couldn't be happier about that but hey even if you can't do the patreon or you just don't want to that's all perfectly fine i'm so so thankful for every single person who watches my videos who comments who does all the youtube things it's seriously making this extremely huge dream of mine a very very real reality and uh, real <laughs> reality. Yeah, whatever, I'm going back to being fake. Now, although minigames are the first extras you unlock, I rightly thought that they would be by far the hardest of the three modes that I had left to complete, and I was just a little bit too rusty to jump straight into them. So I'll instead be tackling the modes in order of easiest to hardest, starting then with the survival levels. Of the three modes we gotta do, survival is by far the most similar to regular adventure levels, which naturally meant there wasn't too much of a learning curve for me. All I had to do was refresh myself on how to navigate the controls while blind. To recap, I'm playing this game on console, primarily because this version is in HD. Oh yeah, it also lets you control a full tile cursor with a controller, which I guess is also important. This means that, unlike the blindfolded challenge runners that use a mouse cursor like an idiot, I can actually keep track of where my cursor is on screen, using a popular blindfolded technique called normalization. This term refers to a sequence of inputs that, no matter what, will always lead to the same result. In this game's case, simply holding a diagonal for about two seconds will put my cursor in that diagonal's respective corner no matter where on the lawn I started from. So that's how I can consistently figure out where I'm at. At that point, I can count out d-pad presses to plant plants on the exact tiles that I want, all without having to see. Aside from placing dudes, the other main form of execution is collecting sun, which was a big deal last time. But apparently, there's a collect sun button that's just been sitting there on the controller this whole time, and no one wanted to tell me about this? Cool, dude. Anyway, that's all fine and dandy, but managing our plants is always the easy part. It's the zombies that are the problem, and in survival mode, they are extra problematic. Survivals are effectively just one huge, increasingly difficult adventure level, with occasional breaks to select new plants and further build up our defense. This is immediately an issue for us, because none of our original adventure mode strats were ever designed with longevity in mind. Since I'm a blind man, the prevailing strategy was usually to fully invest in quantity of plants over quality, filling the entire screen with the cheapest garbage I could find to sort of brute force our way through every level. However, though this technique does have a pretty high floor, which is why it worked on all the adventure levels, it has an incredibly low ceiling, meaning it definitely won't last as more difficult ways start coming in, and more importantly, there's no good way to improve the defense over time as that difficulty scales. This means that we not only need new strats, but 
but an entirely new approach. So allow me to introduce my patented blind man survival system. The idea here is that I've split each survival into three distinct phases, the setup, the buildup, and the maintenance sub. Each phase has its own distinct goals, so let's tackle each one at a time. First off, we got the setup, and this one's pretty simple. We just need to fend off the first couple zombies and collect a stupid amount of sun. And these two goals actually go hand in hand. How much sun we collect depends both on how many sunflowers we put down and on how much time passes, the latter of which can be affected by how fast we're killing zombies. If we're just completely mowing through them, blowing zombies up like as soon as they spawn, then we'll be forcing waves to advance really, really quick, giving us way less time to build up that sweet, sweet nectar. So instead, it's a much better idea to take things as slow as possible in the beginning, killing zombies only when the next wave has already been automatically spawned to ensure that our sunflowers get plenty of time to do their job. But this is much easier said than done for the blind man. Killing zombies slowly requires that we don't use any of our regular ranged attacking plants. They're way too quick with it. Instead, we'll want to use our short range dudes, like potato mines and squashes, so zombies have all the time in the world to reach the end of the lawn first before they die. However, I can't see where the zombies are at, and we don't have enough time or resources to cover every single lane with one of these dudes, which means we're gonna have to somehow find a way to accurately locate each and every zombie that spawns. And the way that we're gonna do that is with a little trick that I like to call the puff wall. As soon as the level starts, as I'm planting my sunflowers, I would also simultaneously start filling that first column with completely free puff shrooms. They're way too sleepy to actually do any damage, but they give me a much more important resource, information. As this makes it so that every time a zombie spawns, he'll immediately eat one of them. This not only notifies me that there is a zombie somewhere that needs to be dealt with, but I can also very quickly figure out which lane he's in by determining which lane no longer has a puff shroom, using my patented shovel tapping technique. So to recap, the shovel is one of the most important tools in our arsenal. Its intended purpose is to remove plants from our lawn by holding down the B button, but its main use, for the blind man at least, comes from just tapping the B button. If I do this on an empty tile, then it won't do anything. But if I shovel tap on a tile with a plant in it, then it'll make an extremely faint shovel sound effect. Basically, you can think of it as my walking cane that makes sounds when I hit stuff. If I do this on every lane then, the tile that produces no sound effect must have been the fresh scene of the crime. So I can replace the puff shroom, place a potato mine or squash to eventually kill the zombie, and rinse and repeat. In other words, uh, yeah, we can basically just see. But this obviously won't work forever, at some point I'll actually have to put some real plants down. So once it gets to the point where two zombies spawn at a time, I'd cover one of them with a short-ranged boy, and the other with a snow pea. That's right, these guys were my hard carry last time, and they're keeping their top tier status, cause oh my god, they're absolutely insane for us. Slowing down zombies is just such a good effect, it allows us to continue stalling out the beginning for more sun, and it effectively increases the DPS of every plant we put down in the future. And so, now that we have our setup completed, now seems like a pretty good time to start the buildup of our defense. In doing so, we have to consider which of our available attacking plants are the best, not only in terms of damage output, but also in terms of general versatility and yeah, it's star fruits. Look, I know I said I would invest more in quality over quantity, but these guys are both, alright? They're stupid good. Their DPS is honestly not that great, but they easily make up for it through the fact that I'm planting freaking 20 of them, and the fact that they counter a ton of different special zombie types, which I'll touch more upon later. I also made use of spike weeds, mostly because planting star fruits too far up would just have them constantly die, and spike weeds simply don't have that problem. And speaking of protecting my star fruits, I also started making use of pumpkins for the first time in the challenge. And yeah, these guys are probably gonna have the biggest glow up in this entire video, because they're pretty much essential defensive plants in survival. Plus, my entire screen's full of plants anyway, so he's kind of the only one I can put down. And so, now that our defense is properly built, it's time to move to the last and longest phase, the maintenance. Uh, this phase has a ton of goals, but they all pretty much boil down to don't die. Keep planting pumpkins, replace anything that gets eaten, try my best to keep my plants from exploding, you get the drill. However, there are a couple additional goals of this phase that you might not have expected. One of the most important is money collection. Because I'm a blind man, there's absolutely no way to accurately keep track of how much cash I got, and the best way to counter that is to simply get way more than I'll ever actually need. The issue is that my collect sun button doesn't also automatically collect coins, so I have to go out of my way to manually collect money either when I've got time on my hands or when I hear that sweet, sweet sound of diamonds. What happened? My... Is that a digging zombie? Oh. But why do I need money to begin with? Well, that's where the most important goal of the maintenance up comes into play dealing with special zombies, which are unique to the hard survival levels. I haven't mentioned it yet, but each area actually has both a normal survival level and a hard survival level. I'm not going to be making a huge distinction between the two, I'm pretty sure the hard variations are mostly just longer, and I used almost the exact same strats across both modes and they worked basically the same. But there's exactly one significant difference between the two difficulties, and that is the presence of random special zombies. The first round is always the same in these levels, but every single round after that will toss in anywhere between one and four special boys, in which ones 
items are thrown your way is completely randomly determined. The game does show you which types of zombies will spawn before the round starts, but the blind man can't see that, so we've got to be prepared to defend against every type of zombie that is possible to spawn. Luckily, most of them are either pretty inconsequential or already completely countered by the plants we're currently using. Additionally, there's one special zombie that's actually beneficial for us, and that's the ladder zombie. The main gimmick of these guys is, oh, you won't freaking believe this, their ladder, which they plop down on whatever defensive plants they can find, which is our pumpkins in this case. This allows other zombies to just mosey on past them like they're nothing, which I'll admit does seem like a pretty bad thing on the surface. They ate a bunch. They're eating a ton. Where's my pumpkins? What? Where? 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 However, this is actually great for us. Number one, it makes the plant that got laddered 100% invincible to most zombies, which greatly lessens our load during the maintenance subphase, where all we're really doing is making sure our plants don't die. And the fact that ladders allow zombies to get deeper into our defense isn't nearly as bad as it seems, because walking over our plants immediately puts them into the crossfire of like five times the amount of star fruits. Seriously, zombies die like the instant they touch a ladder. It's pretty good. Unfortunately, though, our luck runs out when it comes to the rest of the special zombies. Because yeah, all these guys stink. Digging zombies aren't the worst, but they're certainly very annoying. All of our star fruits do shoot backwards, so it's not like killing them is any sort of problem, but they are still able to slowly eat away at my back line. Luckily, I am extremely smart, and I put my sunflowers in the back where they belong, so I never lose any attack power, which is the most important thing. Balloon zombies are next up, and these guys we actually gotta manually kill with blowers, because weirdly enough, there isn't a single plant in the entire game that pops their balloons. Like, you'd think they'd add at least one, but no. Luckily, dealing with them ourselves really ain't too bad. All we gotta do is make sure we select blowers in every round after the first, and then be on the lookout, or a here out for their telltale balloon zone, which we can react to by clearing a tile for our blower. Next up, we got Zombonies and Catapult Zombies, and this is where that cash money I was talking about earlier finally becomes a factor. See, usually spike weeds are a good counter to both of these guys, but although they do instantly kill them, it also kills the spike weed, and these levels throw out so many dang vehicles, there's no way I'd be able to keep up in terms of both sun and recharge time. So I decided fairly early on to invest in our very first plant upgrade, Spike Rocks. Plant upgrades have been available to us in the shop for ages at this point, but of all always been wary of buying them for a bunch of reasons or whatever. The thing is, now I'm cracked at the game, I'm rich as heck, and we're gonna absolutely need some of these dudes to carry us into the end game. Spike Rocks, for example, are an absolutely huge addition to our roster. They not only deal double damage compared to those lame spike weeds we were already using anyway, but they're also a way better counter for the certified vehicle operators. They go from being able to insta-kill one to being able to insta-kill freaking eight. What in the world? But killing these guys isn't the only reason I bought Spike Rocks. In fact, it's not even the main reason. Say hello again to the last of the special zombies, the god dang Gargantuars. Now I did run into these guys a couple of times in some of the later adventure levels, but saying that I ever figured out how to deal with them wouldn't quite be true, because I didn't. There are two big issues with the Gargantuars. The first is that unlike most other special zombies that have telltale sound cues that indicate when and sometimes even where they are, Gargantuars don't. The best they got is a unique idle sound effect, which while better than nothing, isn't that great considering it occurs completely randomly and therefore has a chance to simply not play at all. The second issue with Gargantuars is that these guys are absolutely massive. They have entirely too much health and their big smash attack kills every single plant in the entire game instantly. Well, except for one. That's right, Spike Rocks are far and away the best counter for Gargantuars, especially for the blind man. Primarily because they can tank not just one hit, no, you guessed it, it's eight again, eight hits. You're still smacking it. How much health does it have? This not only produces a unique sound effect that immediately tells me when one of these dudes spawns, but it also means that Gargantuars will often just die before they kill any of my plants. And even if they do start smashing more, the fact that they're pretty much the only zombies capable of killing spike rocks means that I can use shovel tapping to figure out exactly which lane they're in and finish them off with an instant. Oh, and the imps? Yeah, I mean, they also die pretty quick. So anyway, with all that nonsense finally out of the way and a proper execution of my setup, build up, and maintenance up, we've finally taken care of both the normal and hard survival level. You know, for daytime. Now we just gotta do that for every other area in the dang game. Luckily, the differences between the various worlds aren't actually too crazy, and they only barely affect any of our strategies. Both of the dark areas have a much simpler setup, as those puff shrooms I was using before have finally gotten their rest, so they can deal with zombies on their own now. Aside from that, the night levels in particular introduced graves, which just meant that I had to occasionally scan my lawn with the Grape Buster, which wasn't a big deal. And the fog levels strangely didn't introduce any unique or interesting mechanic at all, they were just the pool levels, but at night, which is just kinda like a weird decision by the developers, but I don't know, whatever. I guess. Anyway, speaking of the pool, how did it affect our strats? Well, not too much, honestly. There are two special zombies that spawn specifically in the pool, those being the snorkel and dolphin rider zombies, but I can counter both of them real easy by just slapping a couple tall nuts in there. Or even like four, you know, just in, just in case, or maybe even like six with pumpkins, just to keep it extra safe. The pool also allowed us to utilize the second plant upgrade that we'll be seeing in this video, the cattail, which is pretty okay. They have an all right homing shot, which is fairly useful, especially during our 
setup phase, but its main use comes in the form of automatically dealing with balloon zombies. Yeah, sorry, I did lie earlier about there being no plants that pop their balloons, but like, it's still weird that the only one in the entire game is locked behind a paywall in a shop. It's just kind of strange. And finally, we got the roof, which didn't really change much either. I mean, it just ruined our entire strategy and forced us to create a completely different one. God dang it, dude. There are like a million problems with the roof, but the two main ones are the requirement of flower pots and the incline. The first one just deletes our spike weeds and spike rocks, which is kind of messed up, and it makes our puffball strat way worse, meaning we'll have to re-engineer our setup a bit. The incline, on the other hand, is just stupid. It basically just invalidates our star fruits. Any boys that we put on the left of the roof will have half their bullets blocked, and any boys that we put on the right will have half their bullets just fly over zombies' heads. And it's not just the star fruits. This is the case for every single straight shooting plant we got, which means our entire buildup is also going to have to change to include mostly one of the lobbing plants. The thing is, all these guys stink. You know, all three that exist. Colonels were my original go-to in the adventure roof levels, but these guys are nowhere near consistent enough to last through five times the amount of level. Cabbage bolts can last us a little bit longer, but they simply don't have the damage to deal with later waves. Melon bolts, however, do have pretty solid damage, but their high cost makes setting them up too slow to actually get them going. In all of my attempts, none of these guys were even close to enough. Which is why I had to pull out the secret fourth lobbing plant, the winter melon. Yeah, I told you money would be important. I almost couldn't afford this one. Now you might initially think that these guys have the same problem as melon bolts, cause yeah, they cost 500 sun, which is way more than any of the other plants we've ever used. But the difference is that while a single melon bolt really struggles to defend a lane on its own, winter melons can survive for ages and their splash damage can even spread their slowing effect to other lanes, making them significantly more cost effective despite the fact that their cost is insane. But now that we got our boys of choice, we gotta figure out how they rest of our strats need to change to accommodate for the new recruits, starting with the roof-specific setup phase. Now, like I've already mentioned, we can't use the puff wall this time around, and although we could try to use flower pots in the same way, these things aren't literally free, which is an issue when we gotta be saving up our sun for, uh, you know. So instead, I opted to just use one flower pot, one potato mine, and one squash right at the beginning, and then I'd just hope that the first zombie wouldn't be in the bottom two lanes. If I did get lucky and the zombie died to one of my traps, then I'd be able to put down another three boys for the second zombie, except this time running into one of my plants wouldn't be up to luck because I've got them all covered, and depending on which lane he'd spawn on, I'd be able to react accordingly and set up for the next zombie. I'd then repeat this flowchart for the next few dudes until I had enough sun to start planting melons in all my lanes, closing out our setup phase. Now our buildup for the roof is where things get a little weird. See, I want all my lanes to have winter melons for offense as well as some sort of defensive plant, but the fact that all of these things have insanely long recharge times means that we can't build this up quickly, and we kind of need to go quick because our lanes are absolutely in danger of dying pretty dang soon. This means that our buildup has to be asynchronous, which is a little interesting. I'd first plant winter melons on my second and fourth lane, as these positions maximize the melon splash damage. Then, while I'm waiting for the cooldown, I'd place both a tall nut and a pumpkin on two of my lanes with no winter melon. Then, while I'm waiting for those cooldowns, I'll build up the sun necessary to plant a second melon on my last lane. Yeah, it looks like garbage, but this buildup ensures that none of my lanes are exceptionally weak at any given time, which is important for a not losing. Anyway, at that point, my winter melon cooldown would be done, so I could restart and repeat this cycle of plants over and over until all of my lanes eventually converged into a pretty dang good defense. From there, our maintenance up was pretty simple. I put down some umbrella leaves to counter the bungee and catapult zombies that never showed up. I selected blovers again to counter the balloon zombies that never showed up. I mentally prepared myself for the gargantuars that also never showed up. Yeah, no, I really just put down a bunch of pumpkins and sat there until I won. But once I did, it finally marked the end of the survival levels, which despite the many, many new strategies that I had to pull out was indeed the easiest of the modes we gotta do. Oh yeah, things are about to get real, and that's because things are about to get random. Going into this challenge, I actually initially assumed that the puzzle mode was going to be the easiest. However, the issue is that I was only about half right. The puzzles consist of two types of levels, vase breakers and eye zombies, and the latter levels were indeed pretty dang easy. These guys have a switch rolls, placing zombies down to kill a bunch of plants, and you usually only need one or two zombies on each lane to do the trick. The difficulty comes from the fact that we're limited in how many zombies we can use, with our currency, which is still sun for some reason, only being obtainable by having our zombies eat sunflowers. Oh yeah, I also can't see the plants, which kind of makes it hard to figure out which zombies to use. But despite all that, it's actually quite a bit simpler than you may expect to figure out what's in a lane. All you have to do is put a zombie down and listen for what sounds the plants start making in response. The general strategy then was to put a cheap zombie on every lane to get an idea of what we were working with. If a lane made a bunch of bad sounds, then we'd just avoid that one for a bit. But if a lane was real quiet, then that probably meant it just had a bunch of sunflowers or some other plant worth killing. So we'd clear that one out first. And yeah, that's all it really took to beat the eye zombie levels. Like I said, they were pretty dang easy. And at some point, I really got into the zombie persona and stopped using my brain entirely, which surprisingly worked pretty well. But like I said, this was the half of the puzzle mode that I was right about. As for the other half, I couldn't have 
been more wrong. No one could have prepared me for how detrimentally difficult the godforsaken base breaker levels would be. Now, if you watched my last video, then you might be a little confused at this, because level four, five, and adventure was actually just three back-to-back -back base breaker levels, and those things weren't a problem at all. The issue is that adventure mode was made for children, whereas these things are only meant for the most seasoned vase connoisseurs, apparently, because oh my god, they're so much worse. Okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit, because the first vase breaker it actually wasn't that bad. There are no lawnmowers and a lot more vases, but I ended up scraping by with the same strats as last time. So here's the deal with these guys. Every vase breaker level has a set number of specific plants and zombies, and every time you start the level, it randomly places them in the vases, with the goal being to break them all without dying to the zombies. The difficulty is supposed to come from the fact that you don't know what's in each vase until you break it, but the blind man, he doesn't know what's going on even after he breaks it, which is a pretty huge issue. The only information that we can glean is whether or not a broken vase had a plant or a zombie in it, as this super faint sea packet sound will play if there's a plant, and it won't play if there's a zombie. And much like with the eye zombie levels, we can figure out what specific plants we got down by listening to what they do when they're interacting with the zombie. And we can use that information to determine whether or not I need more plants in that lane to fully defend it. Doing all this allows us to pretty smoothly complete our first vase breaker, much like with the adventure level. So then, if we already have some good strats to make vase breakers manageable, then how can they really get that much worse? Well, all it took was the addition of one cursed plant the Vase Breaker exclusive backwards facing repeater. I despise these things. They actually make our lives infinitely worse. Here's the deal. There are plenty of levels in this game that give us random plants that we have no way of knowing. And although they are pretty annoying, their saving grace is that most of the plants in this game are at least like okay. Even if it's not exactly what we're looking for, putting a plant down in front of a zombie will almost always at least do something, you know except for backwards repeaters, who do jack. This is terrible news. These guys get introduced in level freaking two and make up nearly half of the plants we have access to for every single vase breaker from here on out, except for like one. So riddle me this, Batman. When I break a vase and get a plant, where should I put it down? Do I put it on the left where I risk it being a backwards repeater that just does nothing? Or do I put it on the right and risk it being anything else? Wasting too many plants obviously makes us lose, so I kind of just have to get lucky and be right about my placements every single time. I did try putting plants in the middle at some point to ensure that every dude has at least a little bit of value, but I abandoned this strategy for later vase breaker levels when I realized that getting extremely lucky was just a requirement. Hopefully they're getting bunched up to run into a potato mine right now. Please. Yes! Oh my god. <sighs> But here's the thing, unlike every other luck-based level in this game, just getting lucky isn't enough here. Yeah, that's right, I also have to use my brain. My main strategy would consist of first getting lucky enough to put a ton of plants down. At that point, I'd test every lane with the zombie to figure out what I had in each one, and use that information to determine which lanes were safe and which lanes were weak. From there, I'd focus on breaking bases in these safe lanes to hopefully get the necessary plants to reinforce the weak ones without having to worry about any zombies that I run into. Then, at the end, I'd just hope and pray that whatever nonsense I put on each of my lanes was enough to survive. Win, win. Yes, yes, dude. Oh my God. Oh. And although this strat would eventually work after some time, each level just required more luck than the last. Yes. Oh, oh my gosh, dude. That one was very annoying. It got to the point where I'd spend hours on a single vase breaker, resetting and dying literally hundreds of times before getting an attempt that was even possible. Basebreaker levels get easier after this one, right? Clearly, whatever semblance of strategy I had could use some change. Or at least something that could make it only slightly luck-based instead of extremely so. But I didn't find anything like that. Instead, I found a trick that removes luck entirely. We only have this fourth lane left, which is really scary. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if I'll be able to defend against it. <laughs> now, how in the world are any of these clips possible? How did the blind man go from not knowing what's in the vases even after he breaks them to knowing what's in every single one before the level even starts? Well, all it takes is a little trick that I like to call checkpoint storage. Remember how I described vase breakers about how the contents of every vase is determined when you start the level? Well, what if we could store some sort of checkpoint right at the beginning after all those contents have been loaded in? If we could somehow manage that, then we'd be able to restart the level over and over from that checkpoint point with the same set of vases every time, completely removing randomness as a factor. And <laughs> yeah, turns out that's exactly what we can do. By pausing and exiting to the main menu, the game will save our progress in the level, which isn't that unusual. The weird thing though is that literally nothing else in the game saves your progress like this. Not losing, not resetting, not even winning the level. This means that if we can find some way to exit to the main menu without pausing, such as intentionally dying, then we'll be able to infinitely continue from the checkpoint we've saved until we can finally beat the level. Now, a normal sane person would use this strat to 
to just be able to retry the same level a couple times, you know, get a feel for which plants are where and whatnot. The blind man, however, for some reason got it in his head that this technique is best used to systematically figure out the contents of every single vase over the course of an hour, commit all of it to memory. I have a regular zombie, I have a pole vaulter, I have a torchwood, I have a torchwood, I have a regular zombie, I have a squash and a repeater. Pole nut, I have a pole vaulter, I have a repeater, I have a repeater, I have a regular zombie, and then I have a three repeater and a torchwood. Another tall nut, I have a regular zombie, I have a squash, I have a repeater backwards facing, I have another tall nut, and then I have a regular zombie and a torchwood. A repeater, and then I have a repeater, and then I have a tall nut, and then another repeater, pole vaulter. Pretty sure it's a pole vaulter, and a repeater, and then a regular old zombie. Zombie, a pole vaulter, a zombie, a zombie, <laughs> a pole vaulter. Uh, and then I have a tall nut, and then finally the jack in the box, the zombie. And then use that information to craft the mathematically perfect plant layout to humiliate the zombies as much as physically possible. Yeah, I don't know why I did this. It's so needlessly difficult. Despite that though, this strat was still a fantastic catch-all, as it allowed us to plow through the rest of the puzzle levels with absolutely no sweat. However, we have still the hardest mode ahead of us. A mode that consists of some of the hardest challenges I've ever had to beat in any of my videos. The mini games. There are 20 mini games that we have to complete, and the interesting part is that all of them are extremely varied. Some of them are just remixed versions of regular levels, whereas others are entirely different games. This means that we're gonna have to tackle each mini game one at a time and develop unique strats for almost all of them. But first, here are the stupid ones. Invisible, Portal Combat, Column Like You See Him, and Big Trouble Little Zombies are all just conveyor levels. And heck, I'll throw a slot machine in there too, because it may as well also be one. These are all completely uninteresting, because their gimmicks don't affect the blind man at all. I just put down as many plants as I could, and that was it. I did have to use partitioning for the little zombie level again, but I already talked at length about that nonsense in my last video, and there's no need to repeat myself. The other two stupid minigames were Zomb Aquarium and Begooled Twist. In these, I just mashed a button. And now is it? Anyone can beat these levels fun. Even you, Jacob. The rest of the minigames, however, were nowhere near as simple. So let's start running through them, starting with Zombotany. These two minigames see us completing a regular old level, but with some beefed up zombies. The first one really only has pea shooting zombies, but even these guys are a bit rough to handle, as they'll constantly be dealing damage to our boys. This not only meant that I'd place my first sunflowers in only one or two lanes to avoid getting shot by the first couple zombies, but it also meant that I invested a lot more into defensive plants, as they'd allowed me to more comfortably set up my boys. It might be the ugliest strat I've ever used in my entire life, but it worked just fine. It would not work, however, for Zombotany 2. This one introduces a ton more zombies, most of which have some frankly insane attack power. Like this guy straight up just kills all your plants. At first, I didn't know how to tackle this one. I had no idea how to protect my plants from just getting massacred every single time. But then it hit me. My plants can't die if I just don't have any plants. Or, well, at least for the most part. Introducing the Gloom Shroom, the only other plant upgrade I ended up buying. Yup, that's right, didn't get any of the others, which means they're all trash. Gloom Shrooms, on the other hand, are anything but. These guys do a stupid amount of damage to anything that exists within a certain radius around it, which includes zombies in other lanes. This means that we can get away with just having two lanes full of Gloom Shrooms and nothing else on any other lane. Then, to ensure our entire army doesn't get instantly wiped out, I'd use a couple garlics in front to force zombies into the lanes I want, which I guess makes them not bottom tier fine. Once I got everything set up, all I had to do for the rest of the level was occasionally replace my garlics whenever they died and let my gloom shroom militia wreak havoc, which eventually won us the level. Oh yeah, and by the way, last stand, just did the exact same thing. Turns out it's pretty good. Next up, we got the Walnut Bowling Duology, and these are a dang doozy. Yeah, they're just more conveyor levels, but they are very different from the ones I didn't talk about, because man, oh man, they're bad. Every single plant we receive is an instant, which means that just spamming them is gonna lead to a ton of waste, which isn't enough to even get close to beating the level. Additionally, the strat that I used for the adventure version of this minigame ain't gonna work either. You gotta understand, in adventure, walnut bowling is the fifth level out of 50, where the first level looks like this. In other words, that was baby mode, and it's way harder now that it's a full-on minigame. This all means that I needed to develop some new stuff, and interestingly, the main thing I started doing also involves the background music, in the form of another popular blindfolded technique, beat counting. Here's the deal, as much as we can fool ourselves into thinking we can count seconds consistently, we freaking can't. Not even saying Mississippi helps that much. Here, try it out. Try counting just five seconds as accurately as you can. Go for it. Wow, holy, you were way off. What in the world? Anyway, the point is, keeping track of time is really hard, but it's made much easier when there's music to work with. Music, or at least music that, like, sounds good, always keeps a consistent beat. So if we just count those beats instead of seconds, we can much, much more accurately keep track of how much time is passing. Why is this important? Well, we can use this to determine exactly how far away a zombie is after placing down a walnut. So every time I'd toss a walnut down there, I'd count how many beats pass before it hits a zombie. If I do this with all my lanes, then I'll be able to constantly tell which of my lanes has zombies 
closest to my base, and therefore which lanes need the most immediate attention. I could also use this more accurate timing method to pinpoint zombies that have been hit by ricochets, which was occasionally relevant. Of course, this strategy starts to quickly fall apart once it becomes apparent that every single lane needs my immediate attention, but that's where saving checkpoints and just generally getting lucky with zombie spawns and receiving explodo nuts comes into play. So after enough retries and a whole ton of counting, we were finally able to make it happen. Oh, that's it. Yes. Oh my God, dude. Finally. Oh, get me out of there forever. Walnut Bowling 2, on the other hand, is a completely different story. It's way longer, has way more zombies, and way stronger zombies. Clearly, this one's gonna be way harder, right? Well, no. Not even close, actually. And it's all because of the one benefit we have in this level, big walnuts. At first, these guys seem pretty standard. Like, yeah, they're another special type of walnut, like the Explodo Nuts, and I guess it is better to have them than not, but how big of a difference can they really make? Well, turns out it's a huge one. The addition of big walnuts now means that there is the perfect combination of available plants to pull off my favorite trick in this challenge, conveyor belt manipulation. See, the conveyor belt isn't actually quite as random as I've been making it out to be. Every plant has a different percentage chance to appear, and that percentage can change depending on certain conditions. For example, if you already have a bunch of one specific plant on the conveyor belt, the game will think, ah, yep, looks like you're pretty good on that front, and give you less of that plant. However, in this level in particular, we can abuse that mechanic to heck. My first maneuver at the beginning of the level was to sit there and do nothing. Once the song in the background does its first loop, however, then I know that I've received at least five plants, the first four of which I would just assume are regular walnuts. Then I'd switch to whatever that fifth one is and completely demolish the level with almost 100% of my plants either exploding or destroying entire lanes on their own. So long as I keep four plain old walnuts on my conveyor belt, the game will give me almost exclusively special ones, which is obviously a pretty dang good thing. Despite that though, there were still a couple things I needed to be mindful up. The first was to not use walnuts too quickly, as accidentally using one of my original four dudes would break the beautiful thing we got going on here. So I made sure to only use walnuts at the same rate that I received them, which is around one every 11 beats. Beyond that though, there really wasn't too too much strategy. Turns out the game's pretty easy when all of your plans kill every zombie on screen, so this trick quite easily won us yet another minigame. Next up is a weird one. See, one of the minigames that I was dreading the most was It's Raining Seeds. It's basically just a conveyor level, but every plant is extra annoying to find and pick up. However, much to my surprise, the console version actually replaces this and only this minigame with a completely new one, Heavy Weapon. And this one is probably worse. We don't have access to plants in this one, and instead we control this lawnmower looking thing with both of our sticks. We can move back and forth to collect sun, and we can aim this steady stream of peas to kill zombies. The issue with this is everything! Everything is the issue. We can't see the sun, and our collect sun button doesn't do anything in this mode, so we have to constantly be moving back and forth and just pray that we get most of it. Sun's important too, because there's no way for us to locate zombies, so we're gonna be heavily relying on upgrading our weapon to deal consistent damage. The things that we can buy are a permanent double and triple shot, which are essentially required, a cat tell upgrade that does nothing, I think, and three temporary boosts. One that slows zombies, one that cooks them up, and one that blows up almost the whole screen. Of these, I mostly opted for the slow effect as it would give me more time to accumulate sun, which was the only source of agency I actually had in this minigame. Aside from that, in the latter half of the level, I would just camp the left side more than the right, and that's really all I could do to eventually close out the win. Please die. Yes. Oh my god. Ah, that was so annoying, actually. Okay, I need a break, so let's do an easy one. Seeing stars. It's a regular level, but you have to use a bunch of star fruits. And yeah, it took like five minutes. All right, that's enough break time for me. Let's do the infamous bobsled bonanza. This one's dumb. It gives you zombonies and bobsled dudes, and that's basically it. And it's kind of a ridiculous ask to kill either of these things as the first zombie that shows up. Luckily, potato mines can do the trick, somehow. So I relied on those guys and lawnmowers to protect all my lanes in the beginning. I also took advantage of the fact that zero zombies spawn in the pool beyond the big way so I can just have all my sunflowers live there for the entire level. Once I built up that good sun, then I could start planting spike weeds and spike rocks on all my lanes. Not only because they insta-kill the zombonies, obviously, but also because their piercing damage does pretty good work against the bobsled teams. So once I had all that set up, I kind of could just sit there and win. Although I did have to occasionally replace my spike rocks when they died, and I did use doom shrooms on the big waves to take care of the few pool zombies that decided to show up, so it wasn't completely brainless. But for the most part, just using these guys was easily enough to finish off yet another minigame. Zombie Nimble Zombie Quick actually has a really hard start. Its gimmick is just doubling the speed of the game, but the blind man is kind of slow and dumb, so it's not easy to have to react to things twice as fast as usual. But once I got past those first couple zombies, I started to plant snow peas on all my lanes to get the zombies down to my speed, which made things way 
easier to handle. Oh yeah, and I guess the million star fruits I put down probably also helped a bit. Next up is Pogo Party, and this one's pretty similar to the bobsled one in that it's really only sending out one type of zombie, Pogo Dudes. To counter these guys at the beginning, I'd start planting both tall nuts and squashes on some of my lanes. And because Pogo Zombies just jump over everything, there's no harm in sacrificing lawnmowers at the start either. Whenever I'd hear somebody fall into one of my traps then, I'd either replace the squash that was used or plant a split pea of all things in front of the tall nut that's currently getting munched on. Yeah, turns out these guys are pretty okay when the only zombies that spawn don't actually eat your plants. I'm not gonna move them on the tier list though, cause you know what I did immediately after covering all my lanes with tall nuts? Yup, it's star fruits. Again, split peas probably just made this strat worse, honestly. However, after dominating yet another level with our star fruit army, we were left with only three mini games remaining. Three mini games that absolutely put me in my place through terrible randomness, insane execution, or both. Let's start off with the first one I ran into, the ghoul. I'm just not in a good brain space right now. I don't know if that's easy to tell. This one, to put it simply, is just not made for the blind man. We're essentially playing a completely different game here. It's a classic match three puzzle game, where we have to get 75 matches before the zombies overwhelm our defense. The issue, wouldn't you know it, is that I actually still can't see, which means that finding matches boils down to mashing on every tile and praying a whole dang lot. This, however, is a pretty terrible strategy, but for the blind man, it's the best we freaking got. There are a few things that we can do to improve it, however. We get sun, for example, which we can use to buy some plant upgrades that could allow us to live for just a little bit longer. However, the only upgrade that I found worth it was turning all of our puff shrooms into fume shrooms, as it's a pretty dang cost-effective upgrade, which is real important because we need to be saving as much sun as possible for our other abilities. The first is a bit weird to use, as it shuffles the whole board. This is usually an extremely good thing for match three games, but since I can't see how many matches are currently out there, it kind of seems nonsensical to ever use. However, I generally opt to shuffle after getting around five matches as I scanned my lanes from the bottom up. The general idea being that whatever I shuffle my board into will probably have more available matches than whatever the board falls into. I'd also shuffle if I heard too much munching from the zombies, as it's possible that my current board has a really weak lane in terms of attacking planes, so shuffling can improve my defense. Additionally, our other ability is pretty self-explanatory. It just replaces a plant that died. This is not only important to ensure that I survive as long as possible, but also having more plants on the board gives me more opportunities to find those matches I need. And that's about all I can do. I really don't have much agency in this one, which is why it ended up being one of the worst. So many attempts got so close, including one where I comfortably reached 74 matches and then spent the remaining five minutes finding nothing. But after attempt, after attempt, after attempt, I finally made it happen. Come on, man. Yes, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> I never want to play any game ever again, dude. One down two to go. But if Begooled was bad because I didn't have any agency, then our next minigame, Wack-A-Zombie, is what happens when I have too much. This is another one that we've actually seen before in the adventure levels, and of course, that only means that it's been vamped all the way up. To recap, there's almost nothing we can do here in the way of strategy. The plants that we have access to do nothing in terms of locating zombies, which means that the only thing we can do is scan every lane and mash the mallet button for our lives. However, the heightened difficulty of this level renders this strategy almost completely infeasible. The fact that that we don't have the time to ever plant grave busters means that zombie densities are way too high to be able to consistently mash through them. But since there's no opportunity for any additional strategy, the only conceivable way to beat this level was to simply go faster. But frame perfectly mashing for 10 minutes straight is just not something I'm physically capable of. So instead, I had to make extremely liberal use of pausing, saving checkpoints, and even taking entire days off within the same singular attempt just so I could continuously return to certain parts of the level and make tiny amounts of progress at a time. But after hours and hours of slowly but surely inching ahead into the level, at last I reached the final wave. I placed down a panic ice shroom and made this happen. Yes! Oh my god, get me out of here, dude. Oh, I don't want to play any games. No games. For the rest of my life, please. God, that was actually the worst thing I've ever had to do in my life. And now we just have one level remaining. Dr. Zomboss's Revenge. By far, the hardest level that we had to complete for the adventure levels was Zomboss. And this time, he's got way more health and he attacks way more often. Even with all the strats that we've already made, including Zomboss Manipulation, which forces him to only attack one of our lanes, this was still going to be one heck of a challenge. But here's the thing. It's not just this level that's harder than Zomboss was last time. In fact, I'd probably go as far as to say that almost everything that we've had to do for this video 
was harder than almost anything that I had to do for the last. From having to develop and execute actually efficient strategies, to implementing way more tricks to alleviate this game's randomness, and to pushing both my mental and physical abilities to their limit, I am exiting this challenge as a significantly better blind man than I was when I entered. And what better way is there to demonstrate this insane improvement than beating a harder version of the previously hardest level in my first dang try. Okay, so it was actually second try, but whatever. So, is it possible to 100% complete Plants vs. Zombies while blindfolded? Well, yeah, but we already knew that it was technically possible. But now is the first time that anyone, including myself, can sit back and watch it happen. Yes, that's it. Oh my god, dude, yes. Oh, that was so easy the second time, dude. Let's go. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, if that's not it, I'm gonna be really embarrassed. Hey, welcome to the end of the video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and if you did, go ahead and let me know about it by doing all those YouTube things, especially commenting. That one's my favorite. I do read all my comments. I'm here to remind you that Patreon still exists. If you want to directly support me, um, if you do, I really seriously, I appreciate it more than you know. And I'm also here to remind you that the behind the scenes creator cut for this video uh, is available to anyone for free. So if you want to check that out, then freaking go for it, man. Also, I forgot to mention it in the video, but if you want to see all of the uncut successful attempts and just how many times I ended up failing in this challenge, uh, you can see that on my second channel. I think my reset slash death count ended up reaching uh, around 500. So if you want to see me die a whole lot and then eventually win, then you can go ahead and see that on my second channel. But yeah, um, that's it, I think.